collaboration between seven local business-minded organizations, your Peterborough Chamber of Commerce, the Kawartha Manufacturers Association, Downtown Business Improvement Association, Peterborough and the Kawartha Association of Realtors, Peterborough and the Kawartha Home Builders Association, Women's Business Network, and the Peterborough and District Construction Association. In the past, many of us have hosted our own individual debates, so once where there were seven, there is now one. For this reason, questions have been solicited from the members of these groups in advance. However, if you do have burning questions for the candidates, you can get them to our candidates in several ways. Each candidate has a table around the room. You'll notice a box on their table and we have cue cards out in the audience so you can direct your question and we'll make sure it gets into the box of the appropriate candidate. If your question is business specific, we are asking you to pass it to the front where we have uh, Stu Harrison and Terry Guile um, that will be looking, wave gentlemen, that will be uh, looking at the questions and passing them up here if they're, they're not part of our if we're missing an issue, because we don't want to do that. Um, we also have a few people, Joel and Danica at the back there from the Home Builders. Um, you can also get cards to, to those folks as well, and they will get them to Stu and Terry. Joining me tonight in the moderator role is Rhonda Barnett, of VP of Avid Manufacturing here in Peterborough, and the 2018 Chair of the Board for the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Rhonda has just returned from the World Manufacturing Forum in Italy where she presented on the importance of advancing women in manufacturing. So welcome back, Rhonda. Thank you. <laughs> Questions tonight will be asked by Rhonda and myself after the candidates complete their introductory speeches. The order of speeches was drawn before the event along with the order of how questions will be answered. We like to keep things extremely fair. The candidates on the platform tonight were chosen because they meet the criteria established for the national televised debate. However, we have also offered the other two candidates who will appear on your ballot the opportunity to participate in the opening comments, where each candidate is given two minutes for opening remarks. So this will happen momentarily. Uh, during the Q&A, candidates will each have one minute to answer the question. They will also have the opportunity to ask for a rebuttal. Rebuttals beyond that one will be at the moderator's discretion. Our timers for the evening are front and center. Timers wave. They will be, candidates will see a 30 second warning, which is the green card, the 15 second warning, which is the yellow card, and the red card, that means time is up and the microphone will magically fade. As always, these debates are to allow members of these organizations to learn about the policies and of each candidate and how they will impact business and the economy ahead of voting day on Monday, October 21st, which is exactly three weeks from tonight. And so as always, we, we ask for re respectful debate on these policy positions, so let's get to it. Our introductory remarks, we're actually going to ask Ken Rainey from Stop Climate Change Party to come forward and two minutes, sir. The uh, Stop Climate Change Party was created because we felt that the existing parties were not doing enough to stop climate change. And, and of course, uh, there there are two things in, in this regard that astonish me. One is that we are hurtling so rapidly toward the extinction of, of life on Earth because we've accumulated so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution uh, in many ways, more recently through our cars, houses, airplanes, and buildings. And, and this process shows no sign of decelerating, which it ought to, and the existing particular parties are doing very little to stop it. So we think that it's time we got down a sort of brass tacks uh, in this, and we have put out a new, what we call a new deal, and we have some copies of it at our desk up here that you're welcome to help yourself to. And I'm just going to give you a few of those. Um, one is that uh, there will be rationing of gasoline and other fossil fuel for vehicles 
uh, with provision for essential services. And the speed limit on highways will be limited to 90 kilometers an hour. Uh, Highway 407 will be restricted to electric vehicles. Air, trains and buses will be free. Uh, all travel, air travel, will be virtually eliminated and will require a special permit. We're working on a credit system on that. Uh, compassionate cases, of course, will be permitted. And trains and buses will replace airplanes. Hydrogen will replace fossil fuels for heating and manufacturing. And fossil fuels for Canada's armed forces will be limited to search and rescue and other essential services. There will be no fighter planes. There will be insulation of buildings, including homes. And, and uh, I take it unfinished. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Roger, our independent candidate, I believe is here. If you would like to come to the microphone for, for two minutes, it is yours. Robert, Robert sorry. <laughs> Folks, uh, it's not much of a crowd here, but uh, the fact is that help, uh, it doesn't indicate your apathy. Uh, the fact is that uh, I uh, feel that I've been discriminated against by these people and uh, I'm going to try and just uh, annul this election. But uh, neither, neither here nor there. I have issues about poverty and uh, native issues and stu uh, students at school. They should be paid to go to school, not the other way around. And. Uh, also, I, I, I'm really back, I really back uh, Dr. Rainey here. Randy, isn't it? Uh, Randy. And uh, I really back his, his promotion. I really believe in that sort of thing happening these days. These people up here don't talk about solutions. All they do is mention the problems. Now, uh, I, I don't want to point at fingers, but like, those people should have backed us up. Don't you think, Mr. Rain? Yeah, they should have backed us up, and they didn't. So now I'm taking steps to put an end to this election and start all over again. All right, uh, now there's lots of issues. I've got uh, brochures here, and I've got buttons. Take one or all. That's all I need. Thank you very much, Robert. Candace, you have your two minutes. Thank you very much. My name is Candace Shaw, and I'm uh, the representative for the New Democratic Party. I'm very proud to be a candidate. Uh, I grew up here in this area, in the village of Keene, um, and so rural issues in the riding are near and dear to my heart, though Keene is now outside the riding. I grew up in a small business, a family business. It was called Shaw Audiovisual. We did. Uh, weddings, uh, video, photos, and DJing uh, through the 80s and 90s. It was some of my first work experience was working for our family business and as a very young child learning how to properly answer the phone so it sounded professional, uh, one of the first skills I learned. Um, today I wanted to acknowledge that it is September 30th which is Orange Shirt Day. I'm proudly wearing my orange shirt. Uh, I have the advantage over the other candidates that that's also my party's color. Um, but this shirt was also made here in Peterborough by a small business uh, called Nish Tees, um, which I'm, I'm very proud to support uh, and is run by my brother-in-law. <laughs> uh, but my family have been involved in small businesses in this area for years, uh, as well as working for small businesses and medium-sized businesses here in, in the community. Uh, and I understand the importance of making sure that we have a well-educated, healthy, and well-supported workforce here who's outside stresses from rent or mortgage payments, from medication, from student loans payments are not taking an outsized chunk of their ability to focus and get work done as, as, a, as part of the team at, uh, at the small business or organization they work for here. So our platform, I think, is the most friendly towards business people of any of the platforms. The NDP understands that we need to be an essential part of working with small businesses and that government support is necessary in order for the success of our whole community, including the business people here in Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Bonjour, Anin, Salam Aleikum, and Shana Tova to our Jewish uh, neighbors and friends. Many thanks to our moderators, to fellow candidates, and of course to the organi organizations who brought us here together, and to all of you for taking time out of your Monday night to be here. This is an important election, uh, and we do stand on Treaty 20 territory. This place is my home. And this place has given me a lot. And over the past four years, I've been able to repay some of that kindness by acting as your voice in <coughs> Ottawa. I'm excited to be running for re-election. And my commitments to you are to continue to move forward on lifting people out of poverty, on growing the middle class, and helping the people who are working hard to join it. And of course, on ensuring that Peterborough Kawartha gets its fair share of federal investments. I'm also committed to protecting our environment, fighting climate change, and growing the economy at the same time. Because in 2019, if you do not have a credible plan to fight climate change, you do not have a credible plan to grow the economy. In 2015, our economy was in a recession, unemployment was high, too many Canadians were living in poverty, and Peterborough hadn't had an MP for a year. We've cut taxes for the middle class, we've cut taxes for small businesses, and we've invested in much needed infrastructure in our communities, including investments in the Trans Severn Waterway. We introduced the Canada Child Benefit, we reduced the retirement age back to 65, and we supported seniors by investing in the OAS and GIS. Our plan is working. And I'm asking for another mandate from the people of Peterborough Kawartha so we can keep moving forward on planning for our future while supporting Canadians right now. Thank you. I'd like to uh, start again by thanking the organizers. I know putting together these debates take a lot of work and a lot of time. And obviously, thank you to all of you. It's going to be three hours long, and you've set aside your night to do that. So thank you very much. Um, first thing is, I'd like a government to support small business, one that does not treat it like a cash cow. You know, as business people, we know that some debt may be necessary, but too much debt is a recipe for failure. So we've, my team and I have knocked on 36,000 doors. We've made 24,000 phone calls. We've talked to hundreds of local businesses, and we've talked to all, actually talked physically to 2,000 people. And the majority of people are telling us that it's harder to make ends meet. People and businesses are falling behind, and that's why I'm running to become your member of parliament. I want to make a difference in our community by restoring prosperity. Now, I believe an MP has two very important jobs. The first is to represent our riding in Ottawa, but the second is to represent you here. This means helping with government barriers, tax challenges, immigration, international relations, and overall making sure that government is working on your behalf. Now, good representation means running an efficient office, means responding to emails, phone calls, even visiting your home or your business and understanding the concerns you have, and not just during election time. I understand that government does not create jobs, but instead creates an environment to make you where you are competitive so you can get ahead. Now, I'm gonna do this by what I've been doing for the last 25 years. As many of you know, I've built over 25 companies locally and internationally. I work with four other entrepreneurs here to create Venture North, which is a hub that helps entrepreneurs get ahead. And I worked as the president and CEO of the Innovation Cluster, which is an organization that assists 119 companies to be created, 400, almost 400 jobs in this region, and put $35 million back into our economy. So please allow me to use these skills by electing me as your member of parliament on October 21st. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd uh, first like to start off by thanking the Peterborough Chamber of Commerce for putting the debate on tonight and enabling our democratic process. Uh, it's exciting to see so many people here uh, listening to what we have to say, uh, and it's important to participate in that democratic process. For those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Alexander Murphy. Uh, I'm a member of this community since uh, 2010. I've gone to school here and continue to go to school here. I've also been a member of the Canadian Armed Forces Primary Reserve for six years, and I'm currently a captain in the Ontario Regiment. 
Now, the reason I mention that is because I think, first of all, it speaks to my character. And second of all, I think it speaks to my integrity. And integrity is a concept that I want you to think about when you're listening to what we have to say tonight. A fellow officer uh, in, in my regiment taught me a very important definition of integrity. And that is, it is knowing the difference between what is right and what is easy, and choosing to do what is right every time. And I think those of you in business can relate to that. If you're not dealing in, in good faith, then you won't encourage return to business. And these are the sorts of principles on which our party is founded, whether that be personal responsibility, individual freedoms, fairness, or respect, we think that our policy should be based on those principles always. As your member of parliament, I will fight to ensure that businesses are competitive, that Canada's business potential is unleashed, whether that be through simplifying the tax process, abolishing supply management, or ensuring that we have free trade, whether that's in the country or externally. These principles will ensure that your businesses can succeed and flourish. And that's what's important to us. Because without those businesses, our community will not flourish. Vote for me on October 21st to ensure that you have a more affordable and financially secure life. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to the Peterborough Chamber of Commerce for putting this on. Uh, my name is Andrew McGregor, and I am a financial advisor. Up until recently, I was a full-time dad. My kids are five and four and four. And uh, they recently just started junior kindergarten, thank God. Uh, I went from a, uh, being a full-time dad with no free time to being a politician with no free time. Uh, this has been an exhilarating process. Um, I'd like to propose to you that as a financial advisor, I've also been an IT consultant, and leading up to the call to uh, put my name forward for candidacy with the Green Party of Canada, uh, I was working on a business to help people convert their internal combustion engine vehicles to electric. And when the call came, Andrew, will you do something for the Green Party? I said, well, yes. You know, in my heart, I have been green for a long time. I'm very concerned about the climate crisis in which we find ourselves. And my business was um, positioning itself to help be part of that solution. But now I have this other opportunity. So, of course, yes, I will jump in. What this means for me is that I, I have a, <clears throat> when it comes to planning my business, when it comes to forecasting the needs of my business, you know, if you write a business plan to present to the bank to get a loan, where do you want to be in five years? What kind of income do you expect? And we forecast those kinds of things, and now we must forecast the effectiveness of our business against the effects of the climate crisis that we are in. If I want to retire in 30 years when I'm 64, we have to be proactive now to make sure that the uh, structures, the social structures that we have in place continue to prosper. And we do that by making sure that our ecology and be married together for a very long time. So on October 21st, please join me, Andrew McGregor, and Vote Green for a good ecology and economy future. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. We're about to start and get into the meat of our discussion here today. So we drew on who would uh, commence with the first answer to the question and uh, Maryam drew number one. So we'll start with her, we'll work that way and we will end with Can Candace in the first round and we'll continue to, uh, to move over by one seat at each question. And again, it's a one minute answer and then there can be a chance for a 30 second rebuttal. So first question, today we have gathered here the business community of Peterborough. So how do you see the business community overall as it pertains to its role in the health and wealth of this nation? Thank you, Rhonda, and welcome back. The business community is the backbone of our economy and our party as well as uh, our community. 
uh, is better off because of the innovation and the hard work that you do. It's why we've invested to ensure that we're able to give you lower tax cuts. It's why we've invested to ensure that uh, benefits like the accelerated capital cost allowance allow you to invest in your business. It's why we have worked to ensure that we have three progressive trade agreements in one mandate so that your customer base is one and a half billion people worldwide. It's why we're investing in our communities and in our families because when people have money in their pockets, that spending power directly benefits small businesses. You are hardworking individuals who are parents and loved ones at the same time, and we want to make sure you balance those priorities as well. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, Mike. I mean, it does go by fast. Okay, Mike. So I'd like to start off by saying you, uh, you are the backbone. And as a small business owner myself, I mean, small business runs our entire economy. We know 11 million people, about a third of the population of Canada, is currently employed by small business. If small business is shut down tomorrow, this country would collapse. And so the importance of small business for me is really maintaining that community. If you take a look at a sports field, typically it's a small business. It's got their label on the back of somebody that's there. And so for me, what, what small business is not, is not an unlimited bank account. You know, small businesses cannot handle increased administration. You know, we know in the current government has added 4,300 new regulations in the last four years. And provincially, we saw tons of regulations added. You know, this is the type of stuff that's crushing small business. And so we have to make sure that we respect small business, not consider them a paycheck, and make sure that they have the right tools so they can continue to grow. Thank you, Mike. Alexander. Well, I think uh, small businesses and business in general forms the foundation of any economy in any nation. Uh, when I was serving overseas in the Middle East, I saw this firsthand. I've seen what a, a lack of employment can do to a country. Not only does it devastate the community, uh, it, it, it depletes morale in the country. It, it loses that sense of what you are. I think that all Canadians simply want to have a good job to be able to provide for their families. They don't necessarily want handouts. They don't necessarily want social programs. They just want to be able to earn money and support their children and ensure that their families grow. That's why we want to be able to put more money back in the pockets of Canadians through our tax simplification system. That's why we want to ensure that businesses can operate freely and free trade amongst the, the, the different provinces. That's why we want to ensure that Canadians have more financial security. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. I, uh, I'd like to echo the comments of my colleagues that um, really the business community does form the backbone of our economy and um, as a business owner myself and a serial entrepreneur, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to function with my family, uh, with my background. I, none of that would have been possible without uh, the environment in which I have found myself up, up until this point. The Green Party proposes that um, since small businesses make more jobs than any other, uh, and in 2017, uh, some 97.9% of businesses registered were actually small businesses, um, we'd like to see that small businesses are properly supported, and this looks like capping small business tax at 9% and of course um, our various other investments which can be found in the platform to make sure that um, our workers are educated and employable and prepared for that uh, after their post-secondary education. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we'll finish this up in a small business. I know uh, how people in the business work, uh, often not taking any breaks or time off or vacations or holidays. Uh, it's, it's a full-scale investment when you are an entrepreneur. Uh, and one of the most vital things that uh, small businesses and medium-sized businesses in Canada uh, bring to our economy is diversity. Uh, we know that the healthiest economies are the most diverse. We have seen the negative effects of a monoculture business or a city with one big employer. Uh, and we understand that those businesses lead innovation. And while we face the climate crisis that we're in right now, we definitely need innovators. We need your creative minds. We need your hard work. Um, and we need to make sure that you're well supported. We also want to make sure that we're supporting rural businesses by ex expanding broadband and cell service. Uh, 
uh, and that we're supporting First Nations communities as well by uh, supporting their business growth and ensuring that they are getting the same opportunities in First Nations and rural communities as anywhere else. Thank you, Candace. Thank you. So nobody uh, caught my eye. Did anybody want the opportunity for a rebuttal there? I didn't see anybody, but just a reminder, just catch the eye of the moderator if you would like that opportunity. Okay. Sandra. Our second question is around taxation. So it's one of the most pressing issues for business. In fact, in the, in the chamber world, we see between 10 and 15 policy resolutions coming to our annual AGM for a debate around um, updates to taxation, how we can improve it for business. Um, one of this resulted two years ago in a call for a Royal Tax Commission. So we're curious to know where your party stands on that call and, and how you see us moving forward for an improved tax system for business. So taxes obviously in Canada are very complicated and so for small business the new taxes have been added just constantly compounding on top of that. So one of the things we're going to do is we are looking at putting a Royal Commission together to review all of the taxation. Taxes actually haven't been updated since 1965. The other thing we're going to do is we want to decrease administration costs by 25%. So right now for every new piece of legislation that someone wants to put in place you have to reduce by two. And so the idea behind that is continue focus on making sure that our companies are competitive because the last thing we want to do is see you know 10, 15, sometimes 20 percent of the time and efforts being put into a small company is all based on understanding the tax laws. The other thing from a tax point of view is we want to go back to the previous Harper government's way of doing taxes when it comes to splitting out spousal dividends. We understand in a small business that it's impossible to separate what a spouse does from the operator of the business and we want to go back and make sure that that's fair and that doesn't take advantage of the way it's set up today. I want to lead off by saying that uh, annually Canadians spend $7 billion in tax compliance. Uh, that is an enormous amount of money to be spending on an overcomplicated uh, tax process. And so what we, we are proposing is to simplify it with two tax brackets and increasing the personal income tax exemption to $15,000 which means those earning up to $15,000 will pay 0% tax. Those earning between $15,000 and $100,000 will pay 15% tax. And those earning more than $100,000 will pay a flat 25% tax. This will ensure that people no longer need complex programs or professionals in order to file their taxes. We're also going to do things like removing boutique tax credits that appeal only to special interest groups. We want to make sure that people understand their taxes and know exactly where those dollars are going. Thank you. So Greens are committed to uh, a fair taxation and this requires a, a, a pretty large undertaking in overhauling our tax system. Uh, and you mentioned specifically uh, a royal tax uh, commission. In fact, in our policy is called a federal tax commission. The last time we saw reform in our tax structure was in the 1960s. And uh, we, would, we would similarly like to see that change as well. Um, I'd also like to add that um, small businesses, uh, right now we would cap your taxes at 9%, uh, but we'd like to see some big changes in the way that big corporations are taxed. For example, uh, Facebook, Amazon, um, Netflix, they, they don't pay any uh, taxes on their ad revenues. That's a big hole, big loophole, and we'd like to see that kind of thing close. There's a lot of money to be uh, recovered from the way that we are not taxing these large corporations. Uh, the oil industry, for example, also um, $4.5 billion every year in unpaid gas taxes or in uh, corporate income taxes as well. So fair taxation is definitely first and foremost, or not first and foremost, but definitely a major plank in the Green Party platform. Thank you. tax system needs to be simplified. Uh, we know how difficult it is when you've got a million other things on your plate to also sit down and do your taxes while you're trying to plan out your year or just move ahead with your day-to-day -day business. So we absolutely agree that it needs to be simplified and made very straightforward, uh, especially for small business owners who don't have the time or resources to be hiring out extra staff to manage that piece. Um, we know too that taxes are essential for a, a functioning economy and a functioning nation, um, but we know that we don't want to place an undue burden on small business owners and medium business owners. Uh, we want to make sure that we work with stack stakeholders to create a fairer, simpler tax system, 
uh, one that's straightforward, that's easy for you to manage. Um, and we've found that in the past, uh, governments have failed to do this and have often given tax breaks or allowed tax loopholes to continue for very large corporations. So we would close those and put more of the tax burden on the larger corporations that are multi-millionaire, multi-million corporations, uh, and, and make sure that the burden was not on all of you. Thank you. Released our platform yesterday, and in it, there's a commitment to review our tax system for greater fairness and efficiencies. And so, while I can't commit to a royal commission, there is a commitment to ensure that that review is done. And as folks in this room know, when you have shared concerns, we concerns we have listened. We are also going to be taxing tech giants to ensure they pay their fair share. We are also, in Canada, uh, paying one of the lowest effective tax rates in the OECD and the lowest in the G7. Small businesses have received a tax cut. The pay is now at 9%. We believe that uh, government plays a role in ensuring that those who need the greatest amount of help receive the greatest support, a hand up, uh, and that trickle uh, up economy approach has been working. Over a million Canadians are working thanks to the hard work of innovators and employers, and there's more work to be done. Thanks. No rebuttals. Taxes drew no rebuttals. Wow. All right. Just getting warmed up. Just getting warmed up. No, no, I'm sorry, just the candidates. <laughs> ah, so third question. So further to taxation, we have other burdens in our business, mainly regulations. So business, businesses are expected to be experts in the regulations from all levels of government on top of running a successful business. How will you ease the administrative burden to companies? And we'll start with Alex. Thank you, and I think that's a really important question, uh, and it's one that the PBC has been committed to uh, from its uh, formation. Uh, one of the, the founding principles of our party is shrinking the size of government, and that includes shrinking the number of regulations that we have. When we simplify regulation, when we remove regulations, it enables uh, less bureaucracy, it enables an easier administrative process that makes it simpler for, for small business owners and business in general. Uh, if we enable those businesses to be created and ensure that they do not have those regulatory restrictions, they'll be able to flourish. And that's exactly the kind of thing we want to see. We want to see that free trade. We want to see that free business dealing. And those are the only ways that we're going to be able to do it. And we're willing to commit to removing two regulations for every new regulation that we implement. Thank you. Thank you. As a small business owner, this is a problem that I have faced personally where uh, filing taxes becomes suddenly burdensome enough that I have to hire an accountant. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, I am either an IT consultant or a financial advisor and I can speak well to those topics, but ask me to file my taxes and I'm lost. So um, where it comes to the Green Party uh, and discussing the regulation of filing our taxes, we've actually proposed that um, since one business uh, has one job, we'd like to also see that uh, the taxes are filed one time, and whether that means that we're collecting and um, remitting the HST, that's, uh, that you are you know, the unpaid tax collector. Um, we'd also like to see the federal and provincial income taxes all filed singularly to reduce that burden of bureaucracy. We're business owners, we're not accountants. Thank you. regulations often become outdated, unnecessary, and unwieldy, and we believe they should be fair and effective. They are a part of responsible economic management uh, and managing the, the health and well-being of all Canadians as well as our environment, so regulations are necessary, but we would like to find ways to guide business owners through those regulations so that it's not burdensome uh, to people just trying to run their business. Um, we don't believe that added layers of bureaucracy are the answer, um, and uh, we, we can't commit to oversimplifying the process of removing regulations, but we believe that they should be 
uh, regulations in place that make sense that are current and modern and up to norm up to, up to regular up to sorry modern standards for modern businesses uh, and we want to make sure you're supported in moving through those processes so that you don't find yourselves accidentally uh, you know overstepping something in, in a regulation that uh, that you could have avoided if you had advice thank you Mary I support reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens placed on businesses where regulations are duplicative. When they are obsolete, it's clear that they need to be removed. It's why we introduced the first annual regulatory modernization legislation to remove outdated, redundant, and regulations that don't reflect modern realities. At the same time, Regulations save lives, they keep our air clean, they keep prices low for essentials like pharmaceuticals, they keep our food safe, and in that process of regulatory reform, which our government committed to and has begun, it's important to ensure that we remove that regulatory burden from entrepreneurs and innovators, while at the same time ensuring that we are safe and we maintain our quality of life and improve it. So one of the things our government is looking at doing it will create is a minister of red tape production. It's very similar to what we've seen here in the province. The entire tent is a focus on red tape to make sure it's being reduced. Every minister of every department will be asked to look at red tape to make sure it's not affecting innovators and basically not slowing down small business. The intent for us is to overall reduce our regulations by 25%. And one of the ways we're also going to do this is by working with the provinces. There's a lot of duplication at the provincial and the federal level. We want to continue to make sure that that duplication doesn't happen and it's streamlined. We want to make sure we learn from both our provincial partners and the federal partners to make sure that one rule makes sense. You know, we see a lot of things that change from province to province on a regulation, but the reality is that business is exactly the same. So we want to focus on that. And as I said earlier, the idea is for every one regulation, a new regulation we create, we're going to go in and take a look at two and remove them in order to make sure that our ministers are actually making sure that things are streamlined but safe. Thank you, Mike. So we're warmed up now. We're warmed up and Candace has asked for rebuttal. 30 seconds, Candace. Uh, the idea of an office or a minister of removal of red tape seems to me like adding bureaucracy on top of bureaucracy. We know that there are people within ministries uh, and within organizations that are well apprised of, of which regulations are current and modern and which are not and what needs to be removed. And we know we can trust that we have great people in place to make those uh, to make those decisions and to make those recommendations moving forward. We don't need to add another expensive office to that process. Thank you. Now Mike will be given a chance. So we know there's been 4,200 additional regulations. So the reality is if the current government was doing that, we wouldn't see an addition of regulations, we'd see a decrease. And so for us, it's important. This office will report directly to the Prime Minister because we want to tell the business community that we do believe that regulations are overburdening you. We do believe that your administration costs are too high. And more importantly, we want to make sure that Canada is competitive on the world stage. Thank you. So just a reminder that the candidates only get one chance for rebuttal. Thank you. I enjoy a good debate. <laughs> All right, our fourth question. Uh, CMHC, uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, has developed an aspirational goal to eliminate housing need and to ensure that by 2030, everyone in Canada has a home that they can afford or attain and that meets their needs. How will your party address Canada's housing needs? I believe we're starting with Andrew. That, uh, that sounds like a laudable goal. I think by 2030, everybody having a home that they can afford, uh, that is something that I can get on board with. In fact, the Green Party of Canada has committed to um, the funding of 25,000 new units every year and 15,000 refurbished units of affordable housing constructed for the purpose of uh, affordable rental. Um, and that is something that we've committed to every year. We would also like to um, assist with Canadians uh, in terms of rental assistance to the tune of $750 million every year. Um, and of course, we'd also like to uh, employ the guaranteed livable income, and maybe you've heard something about that. We'd like to make sure that every Canadian can always have the stability and dignity of their home, no matter what happens. 
Um, so the guaranteed livable income will make sure that we can always afford the space that we are um, given the opportunity to rent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the NDP, we know that the federal government got out of uh, building affordable housing sometime in the 80s and hasn't made any significant commitments to affordable housing since then. We want the federal government back in the business of building affordable homes. I worked for condo developers for the past five years. I know that the for-profit corporations are not in a position to be buying, building affordable housing without government support, and that's why they haven't been doing it. So we have a commitment to build half a million affordable homes across Canada, including in this community. Uh, in the next 10 years. We also will be offering a $5,000 a year supplement to renters, to about half a million renters across Canada, in order to top up those rental rates so that they can pay in hot markets like this one is here. Um, and we also offer retrofits uh, as part of our new clean technology shift uh, and we want to make sure that apartments, homes uh, are retrofitted so that they are more efficient, they are easier to run, and will support both landlords and people living in their homes. So, a correction, the federal government is back in the business of housing. We introduced the National Housing Strategy in November of 2017, and CMHC has been tasked with implementing that plan. It's a $55 billion strategy over 10 years, and in this community, we helped shape that strategy, and I'm really proud of us for doing that work. Those units, and there's 2,000 that we need here in Peterborough, which we can build in two years by tapping into that housing strategy, will be built by the private sector, like those here in this room. We also know that ensuring that our homes are energy efficient is important. That's why we're gonna ensure that we retrofit 1.5 million homes to save families money. We're gonna invest $100 million to ensure that people have skills to retrofit those homes. And we're investing in, $5 billion, in a $5 billion clean power fund to ensure that industries like manufacturing can benefit from the technologies that exist out there to build clean. Home building, home building is a great example of administrative burden. Now, right now, if you're trying to build a new home, they figure it's about $127,000 worth of permits and additional work you need in order to get that home built because there's so much red tape to do it. And typically, it takes one to two years just to go through that process. And so, streamlining this at a provincial level and a federal level is very, very important. You know, we've seen this problem come because of governments that add more and more regulation without taking it away because they don't have an organization or a dedicated minister specifically to removing that. One of the other things we're going to do is increase the amortization for up to 30 years and remove the stress test, which is causing a lot of people to have to go to third markets. Um, we're also going to stop money laundering, which the Canadian market is consistently being used for money laundering, and we're going to free up federal government properties as well. Um, but the biggest thing is we need to make sure that we get rid of a lot of the red tape because those developers are not going to be able to build anything. And it's going to be impossible in this community to build 2,000 homes in the next two years. And we heard that announcement three months ago, and there definitely isn't one-eighth of that many homes been built so far. Alexander. So the first thing that we would like to do is ensure that people can actually afford their homes by ensuring that they have more money. That's, that's the first and foremost way that people can, can invest in their housing, is if they have more money to do so. The second thing that we want to do is examine uh, things like zoning regulations to enable housing to uh, be built at an increased rate. Uh, thirdly, what we want to make sure is that demand is not outpacing supply. And the fact is that it is right now. Uh, when we have an immigration rate of between 300 and 350,000 annually, with at least 40% of those settling in two of our largest urban areas, it should come as no surprise that the housing markets in those areas are in increasing rapidly. We want to make sure that our immigration rate is in line with the rest of the Western world, with very few exceptions. We have the highest per capita immigration rate of any Western or European nation. And the fact is that we don't think that that is sustainable. It's certainly not sustainable for our housing market. Thank you. Mary, two things. Removing the stress test is what got us into the housing crunch we're in now. So let's learn from history. Second, impossible. 
I'm not interested in all the ways that something can be done. I'm interested in how we as a community have come together, dream big and achieve the impossible over and over and over again. We can build 2,000 units of affordable housing in this community in two years if we all believe that we can do so by working together. I'm committed to that. Thank you. So far, we have about 64 applications in. We know how long it takes to build units. You know how long it took to build the hotel that we on the parkway. This will take more than two years. When we lie to people, and we lie to people on a regular basis and tell them that their hopes and their chances get up there, and then they fail, they fail in government, and they feel that as a government, we're failing them. This is something we can't lie to them. We need to have a practical approach, which is based on fact, not fairy tales. Mary, I'm Telling people who need a safe and affordable roof over their heads that we're going to remove the stress test as a way of helping them is misleading, unhelpful, and not the job of a responsible member of parliament. Michael. First of all, the stress test obviously is for people to buy a home. I'm pretty sure the people in Tent City aren't ready to buy a home. They need to get rental properties. What we need to do is make sure developers are able to build properties, and they can't right now because the red tape is so high. We've seen the provincial government stack more and more regulations on top of it to the point where it's impossible to get these homes built in a fast amount of time. We need to make sure we reduce the red tape at the provincial level, make sure we don't create more red tape at the federal level, and make sure things are in place to do that. Thank you. Okay, so we're really warmed up for the big question now. The cost of carbon. Carbon tax. So I have kind of a long question, a long summary into the question. So the carbon tax, or fee if you prefer, has a disproportionately negative impact on small businesses. The general population receives a rebate that is claimed to cover the increased cost of energy and there are incentive programs for larger businesses to invest in energy efficiencies. But there's very little here for small business. Reducing energy is not free and requires investment in more efficient processes and new technology. Similarly, reliance on new and currently unknown technologies is an expensive approach and appears to be once again to, appears once again to be focused on large manufacturers. Small businesses must often rely on older technology, including used equipment, due to capital cost. What programs will your party offer to assist small businesses like mine, particularly manufacturers, in becoming more energy efficient and reducing their carbon footprint? It's a mouthful. And we're going to start with Cassandra. Right? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Uh, so the NDP uh, believes strongly in small businesses, but we also know we have to combat the climate crisis as quickly as possible. Uh, if you look at the economy in BC, it's booming and they've had a carbon tax in place for a decade. Uh, it's proven to work. I understand that the business, uh, sorry, that the burden is unduly sometimes on small businesses. We need to find ways to work with you to make sure that it, uh, it works for you and not against you. We are offering programs to retrofit uh, homes and that will benefit you in the increased activity in the economy and increased jobs here in Peterborough that allow people to spend more money with you. Uh, but we also will be offering incentives uh, to assist in transferring to new green technologies and clean technologies that will make sure you can lower your carbon footprint as you go about your business day to day. Thank you. Very nice. It's 2019 and we can't afford for pollution to be free. That's why we've put a price on pollution with the revenue going directly back to families here in Ontario. We know that small businesses also want to be part of the solution. Uh, natural disasters are not good for business. And so there's up to $20,000 set aside for small businesses who are working uh, to be more green and to find those efficiencies. I spoke earlier about a $5 billion clean power fund. The purpose of it is to support the electrification of Canadian industries, including resource manufacturing sectors to make Canada home to the cleanest mills, to the cleanest mines, and to the cleanest factories in the world. Thank you. Mike. 
first of all, we believe it's not a tax. A consumption tax makes sense if you've got alternatives, but there's in any parts of our country, and more importantly parts of this riding, where there is no alternative to fossil fuels. And so we need to drive innovation. So the first way we're going to do that is things like what's happening up at the Clean Tech Commons. Our plan will allow for major polluters to pay into a green tech fund, which will be used 100% for new innovation. We're going to take that money, multiply it by putting in the venture capital, and provide that capital for innovators and entrepreneurs to actually create new clean tech solutions. We're then going to work with them to make sure those uh, solutions are patented and make sure that we can not only help Canadian companies, because we know that only 1.6% of that carbon is coming from Canada. What I'd like to see is 10% of our carbon emissions reduced around the world. We would do that by making sure that solutions are based here in Canada. That's one of our core pieces, and we do not believe that a tax is going to make that happen. Thank you. Alex. I think the fact is that the carbon tax in BC has not worked, and that we can project onto the national level as well. A study just came out of British Columbia that between 2007 and 2017, they saw a less than 1% drop in emissions. That's a fact. The carbon tax did not work. And all it served to do was raise prices for people and small businesses. And when we're looking at that on a national stage, where we do only produce 1.6% of global emissions, we're going to see a less than 1% of 1% drop in global emissions. We need to ask ourselves what kind of policies we can implement that will actually have a tangible effect here in Canada that will guard us against the effects of climate change. We plan to invest in nuclear energy. We plan to ensure that we have a high standard of air and water quality. We plan to ensure to invest in climate change mitigation techniques. And we plan to ensure that we have achievable solutions for these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. So I, uh, this uh, carbon fee and dividend, um, of course we've talked about how this, uh, this fee is collected and redistributed, um, but I would like to offer that as a small business owner when I decided I would go independent as a financial advisor that I would limit the number of face-to-face -face contacts that I needed to have with my clients. And the reason that I did this was because I want to reduce my expenses. In my business I had to innovate and I decided I went with a tablet where they could sign digitally. I would use email signing as best as I can because that means I don't have to hop in the car and go drive somewhere to meet someone. In our businesses when we are encountering competition we're going to innovate and find something for us that is uh, good, beneficial, reducing expenses. You can imagine for example if a construction company can make use of an electric excavator, if such a thing existed, they would have a distinct advantage economically over a company that does not. Um, and in the way so that we should protect our small businesses is by making sure that corporations are and the oil industries are paying the same fee and dividend. There should be no tax breaks for size of business. Thank you. Thank you. So, no requests from Miriam and then to Candace. Pricing pollution as economists tell us, is an effective way to change behavior and uh, drive innovation. Uh, we know climate change is real. All the credible science points to it, and doing nothing is really bad for business. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this, and then Alex. Uh, in Canada, the rate of carbon emissions has grown dramatically over the last decade. So if in BC it's only grown by 1%, as you say, then that is actually a success story. Their climate, their, their economy is also booming. But I will say too that we would rescind the 3.3 billion in subsidies that are given to oil and gas industries in this company and reinvest them in new clean technology across Canada that would reduce our rate of emissions at a much faster rate than any other plans. Alex, I think we need to stop moving the goalpost. And if our goal is to reduce emissions, we can't sit there and claim that we've been successful just because they haven't increased. The fact is that it's making life more expensive for people. The fact is that economists say that the only way a carbon tax would actually be effective is if it were on an, uh, an elastic resource, which at the moment a carbon, our, our, our carbon emissions are not. Gasoline is not an elastic resource. The fact is that if it were to be effective, it would have to be $200 per ton. And our $50 per ton policy at the moment is not only a half measure, it's a quarter measure. Thank you. Question number six. 
Businesses are increasingly working on the front lines of our community's challenges with addictions, housing insecurity, and mental health. What will you do to support our businesses and deal with these issues? And we start with Miriam. I'm proud of the business community, particularly the downtown business community that's stepping up to be part of the solution. One of the things that I've learned in my life, having started a mental health advocacy group at Trent University, which is still there, it's called Active Minds, is one of the biggest barriers for people to get the help they need is the stigma associated with, with mental illness. There are a lot of people suffering in silence and many thanks to the frontline service providers who are going above and beyond the call of duty to do this work. Housing is fundamental to people's well-being. That's why we have a national housing strategy. That's why we need 2,000 more affordable units in this community. For the first time in a health accord, funding was set aside specifically for mental health and we'll continue to invest to ensure that there is a common set of standards around mental health supports for those who need the help in this community. And about $100 million was set aside to support those who are struggling with problematic substance use. More work needs to be done, and I'm committed to doing that work in partnership with our community. Michael. I think so. Downtown is a perfect example. I mean, our downtown businesses did step up. You know, when we needed downtown businesses to step up because we had people overdosing literally on their steps. And we've seen our downtown businesses do that. You know, we've seen our downtown businesses pick up the locks and kits and making sure that all of their staff were trained. And so I think what the, the answer is, is that small businesses do react. You know, we do step in. We're members of this community. And we need to make sure that we've got a government that's always treating those small businesses with respect. Making sure that we're not putting them out of business by high levels of taxes. Making sure that they're always here to continue supporting our community because they are the backbone of what we're doing. And so we want to make sure as a government that we're putting them first. We also want to make sure that we're helping small businesses grow in order to make sure that there are jobs. You know, one of the main things for people when they do have addictions is once they come through some counseling and come out of it, we want to make sure that they have a job that they can go to and, and have some self-credit and self-worth in order to make sure they can continue on. You know, that's one of the key things, and the more businesses we have, obviously the more business, the more jobs they're going to create. Alexander. So I think the first thing that we can do is education. That's, that's always going to be the best way that we can address social change through destigmatization, through ensuring that people treat their mental health the same way they do their physical health. And they should be going to get an annual checkup of their mental health, no differently than they would go to see a doctor. With regards to addictions, uh, I want to see a, a comprehensive uh, nationwide program to ensure that we treat addiction as a medical issue and not a criminal one. This would see the decriminalization of simple possession for all illicit substances. And this is going to have a direct impact on our community. It's going to ensure that these people can seek medical treatment without being incarcerated. Because when you come out of an incarceration, you are, you're going to have a harder time finding a job. You're going to have a harder time finding housing. And the best way that we can address that is by ensuring that they aren't incarcerated in the first place. Thank you. Andrew. On the topic of addictions and uh, mental health, the Green Party has committed significant portions of its policy and funding towards that end, ending systemic poverty, which underlines both of these issues, um, specifically in terms of a guaranteed livable income, and through that, what we call a housing-first approach to mental health care. What this means is that by transferring money into every Canadian's bank account, someone will always have the stability and dignity of their home. We also espouse a universal pharmacare, making sure that uh, anyone has always uh, has access to the medication that they need to stay healthy. Um, we also discussed in our policy dental care for our low-income uh, uh, neighbours. Um, and of course, I'm surprised to agree with you, Alex, I would like to see the de decriminalization of opioids as well, in making sure that um, if someone is ready to get help, that they can feel free to ask for it without that fear of incarceration. So, uh, thank you. I believe in housing first, but we first need housing to put people into, uh, which is why the NDP have committed to building half a million new affordable homes across Canada in the next 10 years. We're not looking at a dribs and drabs, last minute commitment kind of a strategy. We're looking long term and ensuring that people will have places to live in the future, as well as giving a rental subsidy for those who are struggling right now to be a stopgap. Um, we also think that the money spent uh, on addictions prevention and addictions treatment has not been well spent. 
so we think what we need uh, right away is a safe consumption site. I know it's not always a popular idea. Um, we need treatment facilities here in Peterborough. We need, uh, we need to look at safe supply. We absolutely need to decriminalize, but already the Peterborough police are acting uh, in that way to ensure that people are not being unduly criminalized for, uh, for their addictions. Um, and we need to make sure that we have head-to-toe universal health care and that mental health is included in that so that we support people and we help them prevent addictions before they begin. Thank you. Mary, for the second I just want to point out that the question was about problematic substance use and not taxes for small businesses. Interventions like safe consumption sites are proven to work. Mr. Shear saying that he thinks they are a terrible idea is a really bad idea because people are going to die. Thank you. What Mr. Sears, what Mr. Sears said was that safe injection by itself was a terrible idea because all you're doing is delaying death. We need to take safe injection sites and put them with wraparound services together. You need to have both sides. Just giving people a safe supply of drugs and not helping them get off their addiction isn't going to do anything. Candice and then um, I, don't, I don't know about this, but uh, the Conservatives uh, keep saying delaying death is, is all that we're doing with safe consumption sites. Literally all any of us are doing is delaying death. I don't think the Conservative government has found a solution to mortality. I appreciate your thoughts there, but I think that we can't treat people who are dead. So the first thing we do is delay death. And small business owners should not be shouldering that burden. That is not your job. That is the government's job to take care of our citizens and ensure that they are treated before their addictions put them in a position where it becomes a burden on the small businesses. Thank you. So our first question from the crowd, one that's near and dear to me. I just returned last night from Italy at the World Manufacturing Forum. 40 countries were represented, three women speakers across the whole platform, myself being one. So females remain underrepresented in some key sectors that offer better pay and sustainability. What will your party do to improve the situation? We're going to start with Mike. Well, first off, obviously, one of the biggest problems we have in manufacturing, actually, is a lack of skills overall. And so I think it's not a matter of necessarily picking gender. It's a matter of making sure that we're constantly having people graduating into that trade and making sure that they're well-supported. We need all of our young people to consider manufacturing. We need to bring manufacturing, especially advanced manufacturing, back to Canada. And so we need to make sure we continue focusing on making sure that our young people, independent of gender, race, you know, we don't need to divide people. We need to make sure they have the ability to all work because we know that there's a lack of workers. If everyone wants to be in that space, we still don't have enough people in order to fill all the advanced manufacturing positions we need to. Thank you. Alex. Well, we want to start by ensuring that uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is uh, respected. We don't believe in distinguishing between gender or race or, or creed or religion or any of those different identitarian politics uh, aspects. We want to make sure that everybody is respected equally. Uh, and when we find, there are several studies that have found throughout European countries where we've seen this increase of freedom of choice, that uh, these choices enable those uh, equalities. They enable those underrepresentations to become more equal. There isn't always going to be perfect representation in every field, and we need to respect that. All of it comes down to choice, and, and for certain fields, oftentimes we see that there is an issue of choice regarding that. Certain people don't want to go into certain fields, and we need to respect that. And that's ultimately the way we want to go about doing things. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, very recently, I took a break from uh, starting businesses and working for myself, uh, and I worked as a conductor for CN Rail, and I discovered in Sioux Lookout, Ontario, where I drove trains for about three years, um, that when women joined the workforce, it, we were literally same job, same pay. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When you drove a train, you drove a train, and it didn't really matter. Um, and so I, I found it invigorating to discover that that actually existed in Canada. Um, you know, you hear about the gender pay gap, and you start to worry, you know, are we dropping the ball somewhere? Um, in the Green Party policy, or our, in our platform, um, we have committed to making sure that all federally uh, juris all federal jurisdiction jobs uh, are actually same job, same pay. Um, so that's how we would like to at least tackle that from a federal employer perspective. Thank you. Candice. 
Personally, I would start with income transparency. If every company in Canada was compelled to publish the amount of money that they pay, we would see women and underrepresented groups in the workforce able to negotiate from a much stronger position, knowing what their co-workers are being paid, knowing what people in their organization or in the organization they're applying to join are paid, uh, and it would start everyone off on a much better footing. So I believe in income transparency uh, and that we require businesses to publish that information and not salary ranges, but specific salaries. Uh, I also think we need a lot of support, not just for women to get into trades and, under, and industries where they're underrepresented, but support for women to stay in those industries. A lot of the time we get women into the STEM fields, but they leave this, the field pretty quickly because they face a lot of bias and discrimination within their, their line of work. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're doing our best to educate the employers and ensure that women are supported so they can stay in there. We also need a uh, childcare strategy so that we have affordable childcare so that especially women can get back into the workforce. And we need to strengthen unions because unions fight for gender equity across the board. Thank you. Marianne. I, I agree with Candace. Uh, we have a gender wage gap. And in sectors like tech, for example, these are high wage jobs, high growth jobs. We have huge wake vacancies, and yet women make up about one in four of the workers. We are losing out on their ideas, and we can do better. Those women, though, in tech are earning about 26 percent less than their male counterparts for doing the exact same work. We have introduced pay equity legislation at the federal level. We are working on introducing pay transparency measures. One of the things that I have found was helpful in my role as Minister for Women was partnering with businesses and employers themselves. So with the manufacturers, 40,000 jobs are vacant. Women make up 28% of the workforce. What if we partnered with the Canadian manufacturers and exporters and increased the number of women in the trades by 10,000 over the next five years? We asked that question, we set that high goal, and work is underway to achieve that goal. Thank you. We touched on a little bit in the question on carbon tax, but we're going to go back to environmental sustainability as it plays a role in business. And we'd like to hear some specifics because we know that this really is a space where Canada can be seen as a world leader. We can take it, Do we have, we have natural resources and how we use them, how we develop them, how we encourage innovation in general within our business communities. We have that opportunity. So what are those specifics that your party will do to encourage more environmental innovation? Um, we've heard a little bit about clean tech, but perhaps we can expand on that a little further. And I believe we are starting with Alexander. So I mentioned it earlier in the, in the previous question there. Uh, one of the first things that we want to do is invest in nuclear energy. Uh, if you're not serious about nuclear energy, then you're not serious about lowering emissions. It's clean, it's safe, it's reliable, and it has collateral effects on many different industries and, and scientific communities. Uh, by investing in, in, in that particular field, we can ensure that we have safe and reliable energy uh, countrywide. Uh, the second thing that we want to do is ensure that uh, our air and water quality standards are, are enforced and that we're paying close attention to them. That includes things like species preservation and conservation. And this will enable certain small businesses, such as farmers, uh, for example, to ensure that they can continue with their business, to ensure that their business is sustainable. And that's the first way that we're going to be able to go about that. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. So the specifics to encourage environmental uh, innovations, I'd like to draw your attention to Mission Possible, which is the Green Party's climate uh, policy. It's been uh, published since about February, and it presents 20 points of policy that are um, enactable immediately. Uh, and what this, uh, one, one of the two, or uh, one big point that has been included in this, and I'll, and I'll try to uh, elaborate on it for you, is adopting biodiesel. You see, uh, over the next 10 years, um, while we're working towards reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 60%, um, we would like to stop the oil imports from other nations. We have enough here in Canada, and what we'd like to see is the adaptation of local biodiesel production. This means that 
Um, if you had to, for some reason, operate diesel machinery, you could be buying repurposed vegetable oil from that restaurant. Locally produced, local jobs, um, and that would be uh, something that ha we have to invest in uh, and adopt um, over the next 10 years. Thank you. Candace. Closing tax loopholes and stop giving tax breaks, uh, and especially carbon tax breaks, to large corporations and polluting organizations. We would make corporations responsible. And in our change to a, a, a new green economy, we would create a lot of opportunities for people right here in this room and people across this riding uh, to take advantage of the new subsidies, tax breaks for small business innovators who can diversify this economy and can make sure that we have sustainable solutions uh, to the climate crisis. Um, we would also ask that you rethink the ways that you do business, that you rethink tourism, for example, which is a huge sector here, uh, and, and think about ways that we can make our tourism industry more viable in the long term for a clean economy, uh, and look at ways to invest in research and development and ensure that even the salt that we put on the roads or the ways we get around are being reimagined and rethought for a new future. Okay. We would continue to invest in science and primary research. We would also cut corporate taxes in half for all clean tech companies so that Canada can have more incentives to stay at the forefront of the solutions to be made. Our goal is to reach net zero by 2050. It is a bold and ambitious goal, one that we can achieve by ensuring that Canadians have the skills they need to be part of the solution, that those who are already working on them have incentives like tax cuts to be able to move forward. And we need to listen to our children, the young people who are filling our streets in this community and many others like it, have solutions and have something to say. And ensuring that they are part of the conversation is going to be critical to our success. Michael. I forgot so to note early. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Michael first, then Candace. So we're going to focus on clean technology as one of our environmental plans. So basically it has four pieces. You know, one is drop corporate taxes for all clean tech companies, whether that's air, water, or land. Second piece is taking focus on major polluters and having them pay into a clean tech fund. We'll then take that fund and match it with venture capital funds in order to create the capital so entrepreneurs can actually build their own new innovation. We're going to create a brand. Once that innovation is done, we're going to create a brand for Canada to focus on clean tech. And then we'll take those companies and help them sell around the world. And one of the biggest things as an entrepreneur when you're building innovation is your patent. Typically, you've spent every dollar you've ever made. Um, you've borrowed from everyone. And at that point, you built your product. And you have to choose between selling your product or protecting your product. And so we're going to focus on making sure that we cover the cost of your first patent. And so and I can tell you this, this plan is going to work. Partly I fed into it over the last year and a half. Um, my background, you know, in 2005, I uh, built a solar company. 2012, I invested in a clean tech reactor. While I was at the innovation cluster, we added clean tech as a focus. And my time's up. Candice. Uh, one other way that we would address uh, the growing climate crisis is we would not buy a pipeline. And though the pipeline proceeds are apparently going to be reinvested into green technologies, the increased emissions from oil and gas sector in Canada are disastrous. We need to be divesting. We cannot be reinvesting in oil and gas. We need to pull out of those industries in a way that is just and that allows for a transition with training and retraining for people working in those sectors. But we cannot trust a government with a 200-year plan for carbon zero. Thank you. Miriam and then Alexander. We are living in the transition to a cleaner economy and investments in clean technology cost money. And to be able to sustainably transit, transition to that new economy, those proceeds from TMX are necessary to ensure that we move forward in a way that doesn't unduly harm those who are living in the West. You look those people in the eye and you tell them that overnight you're going to take away their livelihood. How irresponsible is that? Alexander and then Kim. Uh, I want to start by saying that we will build the pipeline. Uh, we're going to utilize Section 9210 of the Constitution to ensure that it gets built. 
And the fact is that a pipeline is the only emissions-free method of transporting petroleum products. Whether it's trains, trucks, planes, regardless of the method of transportation, they all emit greenhouse gases. They all emit carbon. And so it is environmentally irresponsible to rely on those methods of transportation for petroleum. It's environmentally irresponsible to continue investing in oil and gas, period. Uh, the increased emissions across Canada have primarily been from the oil and gas industries. Those industries alone emit uh, the same carbon footprint as six provinces across Canada. Uh, and we are committed to a very responsible transition to a green economy, a just transition where we look after workers, where people on the front lines of the oil and gas industry are first in line for training and retraining in the new economy. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, has family or friends out west working on the oil fields who'd rather be home. Andrew? And then Mary. Yeah, I'd like to add that uh, really the most responsible way to handle how we're transporting the oil is to literally leave it in the ground. We don't need it. Uh, I'm very concerned when I hear about how we desperately want to build this thing and I think about free, prior, informed consent and how we've gone about our business not uh, permitting that due process. Um, so while we're talking about the transition over the next 10 years, I would like to see that this transition starts with the cancelling of the TMX twinning, saving Canadians $14 billion immediately. Marion and then Michael. So my question is this, would you cancel the LNG pipeline? Candace, I'll let you. All right. uh, I would only move forward with the pipeline with the free prior informed consent of all the territory. I mean, if things are in process and moving forward, there's little we can do to stop it. Uh, but I do not think that in this economy, in this reality, it makes sense to move forward with a pipeline. It's induced demand, which means you, are, you will always have more demand if you provide more pipelines. Uh, but we need to be transitioning away, and it does not make sense to be building a pipeline right now. Michael, and then we'll wrap up with Alexander. So we're going to create an energy corridor, and the reason why we're calling it an energy corridor and not an oil corridor is because originally it's going to have oil on the pipeline, but it'll allow us to have other energy sources. So with innovation, there may very well be other energy sources that we haven't discovered today. And so the energy corridor will be based from one side of the coast to the other side to make sure that all types of energy can be transferred back and forth. The other thing is we're going to eliminate bringing in foreign oil, which today is very limited, sorry, many dictator type company countries are currently uh, have that oil. We want to make sure we're stopping to support some dictators around the world as well. Thank you. Alexander. Uh, it, it's fantastic that you want to leave the petroleum in the ground, but until you stop using plastic or any other petroleum-based products, you're living in a fantasy world. The fact is that even if we switch over to things like electric vehicles, we will still require petroleum in even our most basic production processes. And therefore, we will still need petroleum. And the cleanest way to get it where it needs to go is via a pipeline. Andrew, I will give you an opportunity if you'd like to go home. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm inclined to agree that going forward in the various ways that we go about our lives, we may still find ourselves requiring plastic. This is good and true. And in fact, we're not talking about stopping the production of all greenhouse gas emissions. We're talking about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 60% by 2030 and being carbon neutral by 2050. Meaning that there may be a circumstance under which it's absolutely necessary to burn fossil fuels. And if that's really the case, we make sure that we're neutral about the overall output. Thank you. So we're going to shift gears a bit. Businesses in our community today are competing with international on online retail giants. We touched on that a little bit. While our businesses spend a considerable amount of time and money complying with Canadian regulations and paying Canadian taxes, these burdens are significantly less for most online retailers. How will you address the inequality? We're going to start with Andrew. Yeah, yes, absolutely unequal and totally unfair. In fact, this is a major plank in our fair taxation policies that multinationals like Amazon um, as a retailer um, should be paying a fair income tax. The, off the offshore safe havens of their income um, should not be tax-free from the business that they're doing here in Canada. They're using our social infrastructure. They have uh, employed our people and they are 
scooping the money out of the country. So yes, absolutely, they should be paying a corporate tax that is uh, fair and generally equal to that of Canadian corporations. Um, and we can extend that um, to our oil industry who has seen significant uh, tax uh, preferential treatment, four and a half billion dollars every year. They don't pay a gas tax when they burn their gas, so we'd like to close all kinds of those loopholes to make sure that business is fair and uh, leveling that playing field for local small businesses, keeping that tax at nine percent. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Uh, I believe that, for example, for the, the big four, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, the fact that they are currently not classified as broadcasters in Canada is a, a, a big downfall. We need to change that classification and treat them in the same way that we treat, for example, Canadian broadcasters, because they are broadcasting in Canada, they are publishing in Canada, and we need to tax them like we do any other Canadian tax or Canadian broadcasting corporation, whether the CBC or otherwise. Uh, um, sorry, not, not the CBC. Uh, but we need to look at any kind of corporation that is doing business in Canada and treat them as we do Canadian uh, businesses, we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can to close those tax loopholes uh, and recoup some of the money that we're losing uh, due to online and international competition that is not being, being treated fairly in Canada. Thank you. Carrie Ann. Part of the announcement yesterday with the release of our platform included taxation on these uh, giants to ensure that they are paying their fair share. <laughs> Uh, to ensure that Canadian businesses are more competitive, we have invested in skills training so that the people who are needed in the jobs they have have those opportunities and the tools they need to succeed. We've lowered taxes. Uh, and of course, the trade agreements that we have signed, Canada is the only G7 country with the trade agreement with every other G7 country. That means that these progressive, fair and free trade agreements are allowing Canadian businesses to compete in a way that that no other G7 countries' businesses are able to. Thank you. First of all, we need to close the loopholes, but the one thing when it comes to taxation is taxation moves slowly. We know that innovation moves at the speed of light, so we want to make sure that we're not adding new rules, that by the time those rules are in place, you know, there becomes the top four. If you go back four years from now, you know, Facebook, Google, these companies have grown very, very quickly. If you forward the next two or three years, you're going to see more types of these companies. We have to make sure that we're closing the loopholes at the actual loophole level and not trying to focus specifically on one or two of these companies because they'll basically split off. The other thing we have to do is continue to make Canada competitive. Canada needs to be competitive. You know, we have too many regulations when it comes today. It's making Canada less competitive by focusing on reducing red tape. We'll make Canada a hub. When it comes to being a hub, we'll be able to bring a lot of these companies here. And more importantly, we can build them here. And a lot of technologies come out of Canada and we've seen it move around and go to other countries. We need to make sure the technology is being developed in Canada is protected and those companies can continue to grow here. Thank you. Alex. The first thing that we want to do is we want to eliminate corporate welfare. Canada spends $14 billion on corporate subsidies every single year. And that's completely unacceptable when that's coming from taxpayers. Re-examine the Canada Broadcasting Act. It hasn't been updated since before the internet. That is something that seriously needs to be examined in Canada to ensure that uh, it reflects the modern reality of our internet community, to ensure that those companies are taxed the way that they're supposed to and regulated the way that they're supposed to. Thank you. I got through everyone, right? Yes. Okay, so Miriam asked for a rebuttal. Just a clarification, that review with the CRTC is actually underway. Alex. Well, we don't just want to review it, we want to abolish the CRTC altogether in addition. So we want to reevaluate the Canada Broadcasting Act, but we also want to ensure that competition is fair in Canada. Thank you. All right, we'll start with Candace for this, uh, this round. Uh, we talked a little bit about it, it came up in a past question around the mortgage stress test. Um, some argue it is doing what it's exactly supposed to do. I know we have heard a lot of comments in the business community and from our colleagues across the country um, that it, it's, it's in a tough situation because it's one solution for everybody. Is there any thought given by your party to look at it at how the stress test is uh, taking into account regional differences in the housing market? Um. 
From my perspective, uh, I, I, I don't think it's something we want to get into. It is something that has caused issues in the past. Uh, and what we really want to look at around housing is making sure that we're not seeing, uh, you know, one solution fits all. Uh, we would work with municipalities, with provinces um, across the country to ensure that different areas and regions are seeing solutions that work for them. What works for Peterborough is not going to work for the rest of the riding. So we want to make sure that we are creating housing solutions that are going to work across the sector and in some places that means building more affordable housing. In some places that means finding ways to make it more possible for people to buy homes. But just applying a one-size-fits-all solution across the country is not going to work. Mary. Um, I believe I've, I've made uh, my point on, on the stress test clear. Uh, I also agree with my MEP colleague here. We need the full range of housing solutions across the spectrum, everything from shelters to transition housing to home ownership. What we are supporting is building more housing. What we are supporting is ensuring that these are energy efficient homes. What we are putting forward is a first time home buyer's incentive for people of my generation who are having a hard time coming up with a mortgage uh, or with a down payment and coming up with that monthly mortgage. The government of Canada is stepping in and saying, we want to be part of this with you so that you're able to begin that journey of home ownership. Thank you. Michael. Well, first of all, we are going to remove the stress test. And what the stress test has done, first of all, is it's not regionally specific. It's across the across the board. You know, what it's done is it's driven up the third party or the private mortgage industry, which has actually brought a lot more money laundering because it's not less tracked. And what it's done is put a much bigger financial burden on the individuals that are trying to get a mortgage because they end up going to a third party or to a private mortgage provider in order to get that that um, down payment. So one of the other things we're going to do is just make life more affordable. You know, make sure that we take the HST off of home heating. Um, get rid of the carbon tax, which is also on top of your heating. You know, help you upgrade or insulate your home through our green tax credit. So allowing you to um, basically upgrade your home, both insulation and windows, and to get some of that money back, just like if you're going to get an RSP. And the uh, last thing is we're going to allow you to change the amortization from 25 years to 30 years, which should bring down your monthly payments by about 12%. Alexander. Well, one of the things we need to examine is the fact that a national housing strategy ignores geographically specific socioeconomic factors. Uh, and like what Candace said, what works for Moncton, New Brunswick, which might have an average housing price of $120,000, is not going to work for Peterborough, where we might have an average housing price of $400,000. And for this reason, we need to focus on policies that we can implement at the federal level, that the federal government has jurisdiction over and ensure that the provinces have the power that they need to enact housing policy specific to their geographic region. And some of the things that we can implement at the federal level are property security, uh, making sure that foreign nationals, individuals, or organizations aren't coming in and buying up huge swaths of land in Canada. And this isn't just about housing either. This includes farmland as well, where we're seeing massive foreign corporations coming in, buying up farmland, and it decreases the availability for Canadians. If we turn land and housing availability into a national security issue, then we can correctly address this problem. Thank you. I work as a financial advisor, and one of the most common questions that I have with my clients who are young families with young children is, hey, now I'm an old millennial, I'm 35 years old, my kids are growing up, now can I buy a house? Because millennials have been saying for a long time, we just can't afford to buy the house. The stress test is good at making sure that Canadians don't buy too much house. The stress test is necessary to make sure that if there is a variable interest rate, that you can pay that interest rate as it continues to go up. And as a financial advisor, I have had to look my clients in the eye and say, no, you currently can't afford to do that. It's out of your budget. You need to live within your means. And this is a good, uh, good way of living for Canadians. I'd like to offer that I think a much better solution is to get our young generations off to a better start. I want to abolish tuition and I want to abolish student debt. I graduated with $46,000 in debt and was so a slave to $700 payment a month. That could have been a mortgage when I was 22 and instead had to wait a very long time before entering that market. Let's get our young, educated workers buying houses. Thanks. Miriam and then Candice for a rebuttal. Clarification around the national housing strategy. It was developed with, municipality, with municipalities, with communities like Peterborough, and it's municipalities that come up or organizations providing housing 
come up with a plan for what they need in their community and they put that forward to Ottawa. It's not Ottawa telling people in this community how to do it, it's this community telling Ottawa what we need and getting those dollars here. That's how the National Housing Strategy is working. While I'm all for supporting first-time homebuyers, the Liberals' uh, first-time homebuyer incentive, I think is not a good deal. It's coming across as a generous gift that the Liberal government is giving to first-time homebuyers, but in actual fact, uh, it's a home equity loan. So they basically own, if, if they give you 5% of your house, they own 5% of the equity of your home, which increases over time as the value of your house increases, which means when you then go and sell your house, you're not paying them back at the rate that they originally, the, the amount they originally invested in, you're paying back as it has grown in value. Uh, so that's something that I think a lot of first-time home buyers wouldn't know in advance, and it's digging them when they sell their homes. Mary, do you want to respond to that? And then What's Michael. the NDP's plan to help people own their first home? Well, part of our plan would be to ensure that people had more money in their pocket first off by not having to pay for farm care and for Medicare. So we would make sure that people month to month are not having to pay expenses like medicines and dental care for their families. If you've got three kids, those expenses could add up really quickly. And you want to make sure that we put that money towards home buying rather than towards health care. Uh, I know someone who told me the other day that he, he has a $280 prescription a month. Uh, that could go a long way towards saving for a mortgage. Michael and then So I understand when the stress test is put in place, it's put in place to make sure that people, in case the interest rate goes up. Right now, people have been prevented over the last couple of years from buying a house because of the stress test. The, mortgage, the rate values here in town, property's gone up 11%. So unfortunately, they haven't been able to. And quite frankly, if we're that worried that interest rates are going to be all going up, why are we over the next four years putting this country in another hundred billion dollars worth of debt? But we're going to have to pay interest on that, which is clearly going to go up. So we are introducing a national pharmacare plan and we're helping Canadians buy their first home. Candice and then Alex. Is this the same plan that you promised 20 years ago you were going to introduce? Or is this a different one? Because it, it has been sort of in the in a promise. I mean, we've seen so many promises from the Liberal government, pharmacare, uh, childcare, uh, voting reform, and I'm just not seeing them come through. The NDP have a strong record of implementing what we promise, uh, and we move forward on it. So I'm just wondering, you know, are we going to wait another 20 years for pharmacare, or is it going to come, you know, in this next mandate, or are you going to promise it again in another four years? In 21 days from now, Canadians have a choice to make, and I hope we choose to move forward. Thank you. Alex. I think the biggest question about all of this and all these wonderful, fantastic promises on paying for everything is how the government plans to pay for those things. I mean, we are already billions of dollars in deficit every year and $788 billion in debt as a nation. Where is this money coming from other than from taxation, other than hurting businesses and individuals in Canada? As you brought it up, I will allow you to answer and then we'll finish. All right, so we have a very clear plan in place. One is to close corporate tax loopholes, allow people to put money offshore, which uh, costs us about $25 billion a year in tax revenue. Uh, we also would add a 1% tax to people worth over $20 million, uh, and that will raise $70 billion over the next decade. So I think that will probably take care of the Firmacare promise. Thank you. So it's getting really interesting. So I've been just given one word, and that's debt. So uh, there's been a lot of comments come in on federal debt and uh, what the various parties' position is on federal debt. And we're going to start this round with Marion. We are continuing with a plan that is working. We told Canadians in 2015 that we would invest in you, and that plan has led to over a million jobs created by Canadians. 900,000 Canadians have been lifted out of poverty. Child poverty rate has been cut by 40%. Unemployment rates are at historic lows, and in this community, unemployment rate has been cut by nearly a half. Our plan is working. 
This is the time to be investing in Canadians. This is the time to be investing in our communities. This is the time to help ensure that the transition to a green economy is done in a sustainable way, in a just way. And our economic plan is part of an overall job creation plan that is working. And we're asking Canadians to provide us with another mandate so that we can keep moving forward on creating good jobs, on growing the middle class, on and, and on lifting people out of poverty. First of all, we can't lift people out of poverty by putting them more in debt. You know, adding another hundred billion dollars to the debt is not acceptable. You know, we had a plan originally to, within two years, to bring our back to a balanced budget. We've moved that ahead to five years because we've seen what happened in Ontario under 15 years of liberal rule and what we have to do now in order to sacrifice to get ahead. You know, you cannot keep borrowing because eventually you'll have to pay it back. And when you pay it back, you end up having to cut programs because you just don't have the revenue to do that. And if our country is definitely the best it's ever been, as I've heard in the last 40 years, why is it that we have to continue to put ourselves in debt? I just don't think it's acceptable. I think everybody who talks to a small child that says, if you're going to borrow money and borrow and borrow, you know, you know you have to pay it back. It's simple mathematics. Thank you. Alex. Well, let me put the federal debt in perspective for you. We currently pay $26 billion a year just to service the national debt. That would pay for a heck of a lot of stuff if we didn't have to pay that interest anymore. That's the same as an 11% interest rate nationwide. It does not make sense to continue to increase that national debt because all we're doing is increasing the annual payment that we have to pay. The People's Party of Canada has pledged to balance the budget in two years by doing things like cutting corporate subsidies, by abolishing supply management, by simplifying our tax process, and ensuring that the Canadian government is acting as the steward for taxpayer dollars, which is its mandate. We are here to ensure that your tax dollars are respected, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, the Green Party was the first party to submit its platform to the, Parliament budget, the Parliamentary Budget Office and have it costed. And uh, it came back um, suggesting that we would balance the budget within two years, much like the Conservative plan. Um, what we found was that this might be unrealistic and we needed some clarification and we are committing to balancing that budget within five years, much like the Conservative plan. Uh, and the way that we'd like to go about doing that is by making sure that big corporations are paying a big tax by closing those loopholes and offshore accounts. Um, uh, by putting on a 1% tax on assets over uh, $20 million. Um, and I'd like to offer this comment that programs are cut um, to reduce the expense when you have to match the reduce in income. We are a wealthy nation. We have the means to afford the programs that we're suggesting to end systemic poverty. And uh, I'd like to suggest to you that we don't need to be afraid of running a deficit. Many of us have a mortgage, and we are working on repaying that debt it's a good debt, and it's uh, going to work to our advantage. Thank you. Candace. Thank you. I think many of my colleagues have misrepresented the meaning of deficits and debt. Uh, a, a country's debt doesn't work like a household debt. It's not like my student loan, my mortgage, or should I get into it, credit card debt. It's a very different kind of debt. When a government runs a deficit, it creates a surplus in the private sector. When a government runs a surplus, it creates a deficit in the private sector. That is how finance, government economies work. Uh, and federal deficits create financial resources that the country needs to put its resources to work. They grow the economy, they create jobs, they create opportunities for entrepreneurs, and they raise the standards of living. Uh, though I agree that we want to be careful with our finances, we don't want to get wildly into debt, we have a very low debt and deficit to GDP ratio, and we need to maintain that and look to the future and know that we are investing in this country in the health, welfare, and education of our citizens and to a transition that is just to a green economy. And those are things worth spending money on. Thank you. And uh, we have a rebuttal for 30 seconds from Miriam. Door after door, people are afraid. They are afraid of the impact that Mr. Ford's cuts are having on their day-to-day -day lives. And they are afraid of the consequences of a conservative in power in Ottawa adding to those cuts. Cuts hurt. We choose to invest in people always. We 
we have rebuttals next from Alex and then Mike. Uh, the fact is that it's a false dichotomy uh, to suggest that you must cut services uh, when reducing the federal budget. The fact is that the federal government spends $155 billion, which represents about 49 to 50% of its budget, on its programs, which means the actual running of the government. And when we see irresponsible spending, like, for example, the $212,000 front cover of the 2017 budget, that's where we see that irresponsible spending. We can reduce the federal budget without cutting services. Mike? So I will continue on that point. I mean, when we see $12 billion given to the third wealthiest family, when we see a quarter of a billion dollars given to the Asian million? development... $12 million. $12 million. Give a quarter of a billion dollars being given to the Asian Development Bank, when we see our Prime Minister go on and have a quarter of a million dollar vacation, I mean, these are the kinds of things that are very easy to cut. We're not going to cut services. We've committed to increase spending on health care and education by 3% every year. We believe we can just get rid of some of the wasteful spending, things like an $8 million skating rink, which was taken down um, two years ago. Thank you. Marianne? Uh, on the one hand, my conservative colleague talks, talks about cutting emissions in other countries. On the one hand, he talks about not doing business with those countries with whom we are working to cut emissions. Which is it? Mike? So giving a quarter of a billion dollars so that the Asia Development Bank can build a pipeline in Asia is definitely not going to cut emissions in the world, first of all. And so I understand I'm giving trade, but we don't need to be giving money to China uh, in order to, for them to increase their economy. We need to focus on money that's here in our country and make sure we invest on here in Canada. Okay, Marianne. We are investing in the so-called 3% increase to health transfers that the Conservatives keep talking about is actually a cut to health services. We increase investments in health through the last health accord and we are going to continue to invest to ensure every Canadian has access to a family doctor or a family health team and our health care system has to be invested in, not cut down. Thank you. I have a question from the audience, and it's related to one of the main pillars of Peterborough's economy, and that is food and agri-food in our area. How will your party support this sector of our economy in the next four years? And we start with Michael. So to start with our government in the last uh, 10 years when in power, we opened up 53 different trade relationships. We're going to continue to open up trade relationships. We're going to continue to work on making sure that our products can get out of the country. You know, one of the big problems we have right now is a relationship with China. You know, we've seen them stop the export of soy or the import to their country of soy. We've seen huge impact because, quite frankly, we didn't put in an ambassador to actually work with that country. And again, we don't need to give them a quarter of a billion dollars. What we do need is treat them with respect but treat them with a hard line to make sure that they understand what our countries can do. And so for us, we need to make sure that our agriculture gets to market. We've got some of the best agriculture and the safest food in the, in the world. And we have to make sure that we open up those supply chains and make sure we focus on trade. Alexander. So I had the fortune of, of attending a food security symposium uh, recently, and there were uh, numerous different issues that we discussed. Uh, but for the People's Party of Canada, one of the first things we want to do is abolish supply management. Supply management currently uh, constitutes the equivalent of a 2.3% tax on the poorest 20% of Canadians. This is irresponsible and it limits our dairy production. When we see things like a 300% tariff on butter coming into the country and then wonder why we can't export our products, that's exactly why. We need to open up our market to ensure that our dairy farmers can sell their product worldwide. We have a high standard of quality here in Canada and that means that there will be a demand for that product. And the best way we can deliver that product to the rest of the world is by ensuring that they're actually allowed to sell it in the first place. Andrew. So in our Green Party platform, we have espoused uh, the, uh, the idea that we should reduce our international food imports by one-third. And what this means is that this will put $15 billion of food economy back into farmers' reach across Canada. 
And what this will mean for us in Peterborough is that, you know, as it continues, as it becomes harder and harder to truck food in from God knows where, um, we can increase our local supply. We need to increase our demand for local produce. We want to see it in our grocery stores. We want to see better access to local food markets. Um, and that increased demand is an increase for product, an increase for processing. Um, and this is a a drive for jobs as well because that food just doesn't magically appear. Um, those increased jobs means an increased income, means a better local um, small cog wheel of economy turning. So um, one, one third of the international food imports reduced and $15 billion back into farmers reach. Thank you. Uh, we have a plan uh, for a Canadian food strategy that will take a whole-of-government approach to addressing regional concerns. Uh, we are also committed to fully protecting supply management. Um, we also believe that we need modern communications infrastructure in our rural regions in order to support farmers. A lot of that equipment that they're using is, uh, is tech-enabled, and we need to make sure that they have the infrastructure in place that they can do their businesses the way uh, that a modern society demands. Um, we also will invest in public agricultural research. Uh, we, would, we will implement local food hubs to enable people within the community, both uh, you know, shoppers looking for local groceries, but also restaurants and connecting farmers to, to those local food hubs so that they have a place that they can sell their local produce uh, and, and other products and make sure that gets right to market. And we have strategies to enable women and young people to get into farming so that we have the next generation of farmers ready to go. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that our former food and agriculture and rural affairs minister Jeff Leal is in the room. Thank you, Jeff. Um, under his leadership, uh, Canada, as part of the broader Team Canada approach to the NAFTA negotiations, was able to protect and stand firmly in defense of supply management and protecting Canadian family farms. Uh, due to his advocacy and many others in this community, we have moved to ensure that Canadians have cellular and broadband access no matter where they live uh, over the next uh, five years. Those trade agreements have opened up markets to over uh, one and a half billion people and so our food producers and processors can benefit from that fair and free trade. We are also working to address climate change. Farmers and growers are on the front lines of seeing the impacts of climate change and they are a big part of this work with us. Canada now has a food policy. Peterborough will help shape it. I encourage you to take, take a look at it online. It's something we can be really proud of. Thank you. So I'm going to take a liberty and skip over to a subject uh, that's really important to me. So I just came away from the World Manufacturing Forum and the topic of the entire conference was on workforce of the future and the lack of skilled talent that's uh, really slowing down uh, business uh, around the world, not just in Canada. So I think here as well in our community that workforce and talent development and acquisition is a top concern for our employers across all sectors. So what are the federal, lev federal levers that your party will use to ensure employers have access to training and deep long-term talent pools? And I think we're starting with Alex. So one of the things that I want to look at uh, as part of our immigration platform is increasing the proportion of skilled immigrants from the current 26% to 50%. And this is going to ensure that we have uh, an immigration program and policy that is working harder for Canadians and ensuring that that skilled talent from around the world can be put to better use here in Canada. Uh, in addition to that, what we want to look at is ensuring that those skilled trades uh, have more transferable skills here in Canada. Uh, it, you know, there's a, a candidate running in the riding next door to ours, and his wife is a doctor from South America, and she's been here for a decade, and she still cannot practice medicine in this country. And when we look at a province like Ontario, where there is a desperate need for medical practitioners, why are we making the process so difficult for those people to practice here in Canada, when they are entirely as competent? We can ensure that the standards are there without making this a decades-long process to transfer. Thank you. 
And so I alluded to the, uh, the Greens um, strategy for making sure that our workforce is uh, mobile and able and skilled. And of course, abolishing tuition um, is going to make sure that as we necessarily transfer away from this uh, carbon economy that we find ourselves in and the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this runaway train, um, what we need to do is abolish tuition to make sure that our students can get retrained um, you know, these skilled trade workers are essentially electricians or plumbers or carpenters, and we need those kinds of workers, and if they require some level of cross-training in order to find themselves into a greener job or a greener economy, then we want to make that free of charge. They don't need to carry that risk. We need their work. Let's get them to work. Um, so that's definitely part of that. The way that we would like to pay for that is by immediately ceasing the oil subsidy, oil industry subsidies. Um, of course, now the platform has lots of other things uh, concerning students and how we want to enable municipalities, offering budgets and funds to make sure that municipalities can hire youth who need to develop their skills, but I'm out of time. Thank you. You're all very respectful of time, so thank you for that. Uh, and I would also like to let you know that it's 8 o'clock, so you're two-thirds of the way through. You're in the home, <laughs> home stretch here. Uh, so, Candice. Um, so we certainly need to invest in training. I have an English literature degree and it's been really useful in a lot of different jobs that I've been in, but if my job is stuff in, or assemb electronics assembling, I need some training behind that. Uh, and what we believe in is employer-led training. Uh, so we believe that the government needs to invest in skills training for jobs, but the programming and the training needs to be designed or at least informed by the employers who will eventually employ those people so that we have the right skills in place. And it's not an industry standard that maybe doesn't apply in a regional sense. I know when Bryston Limited moved to Peterborough, they were able to access training so that their employers could uh, become electronics assemblers. I am one of them, uh, though I didn't take part in that training. I know many people who did, uh, and it's a real boon because when you train people specifically for a specific job opening, then you are able to retain that, that staff member for a much longer period. When they are comfortable and well-trained in their position, they are better able to work for you and for themselves. Thank you. Very nice. Ensuring that people have the skills they need for the jobs of tomorrow is really important, but making sure people have those skills for the jobs of today is critical. It's the number one concern I hear from employers in this community uh, and elsewhere. That's why we've set aside $3 billion uh, to increase training programs, to, to increase work placements, employer-sponsored training, job search help, career counseling, and more. As we talked about earlier, the transition to a green economy is going to require a specific skilled workforce and we have funding set aside and are committed to ensuring that if you need to do an energy audit or a retrofit or build a net zero uh, home, that those skills are av available to you. The Canada Training Benefit is another measure that's meant to ensure that workers have funding, they have income support, they have job protection while they go and upgrade their skills so that they stay competitive and they stay and that they feel they stay relevant to the workforce in which they're in. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. In 2009, the former Conservative government created FedDev locally, which basically supports on-the-job training. We saw that renewed in 2013, and we would continue to see that focus as long as it's necessary. You know, federal funding and on-the-job training is crucial. That's basically how we do train the workforce of today and the future. The other thing we want to do is break down inter, um, interprovincial barriers. Today, certification from different provinces, because of the way the College of, um, of Trades works and other things, like and there other organizations like that, so we need to make sure we break down those barriers, work with our premiers to make sure that they don't, people that are certified in one province aren't prohibited from working in another province. And the last thing is we'll refocus immigration, so that's based on economic integration, which focuses on getting new skilled workers, as well as family reunification, which will keep skilled workers that have already come to our country. And the last thing is we're going to make sure that their certifications that are coming from other countries um, are adapted here, and if the certifications match up, we're going to make sure that the ease of transferring into a certification in Canada is much easier. Thank you. All right, I think we'll take another turn here too. Rail, rail, roads, broadband, rail. What did I say, rail? 
broadband to airports, all of these infrastructure needs are critical to Canadian competitiveness. What is your party's plan to address infrastructure deficits? And I believe we are starting with Andrew. All right, infrastructure deficits. Rail is near and dear to my heart. Of course, I rode the rails uh, for a few years while my kids were being born. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed driving the big rig, but I'd like to offer that the Green Party policy, uh, part of Mission Possible and part of our attempt to address the climate crisis is to revitalize passenger rail service. You might know if you've taken the via anywhere beyond Sault Ste. Marie that if a freight train is coming, you get tucked away and you sit there for six hours at a time while many freight trains go by. Um, and so one of the ways that we would like to see rail properly treated is by making sure um, that there is a passenger service from Ottawa to Oshawa, by making sure there are municipal, local rail services. Maybe we can connect Lakefield, maybe we can put a streetcar back in Peterborough. Um, we'd like to see, of course, 95% of Canadians uh, serviced by cellular wi uh, wireless internet uh, by 2026 and 100% of Canadians by 2030. Um, we don't want to see induced demand by twinning tunnels in Richmond, British Columbia. Candace. Infrastructure spending is uh, important to a thriving economy, but it's also important looking forward to uh, the climate crisis that is looming. Uh, we need infrastructure that can withstand uh, floods, forest fires, and other extreme events, and we need to be investing, like the city of Peterborough has been investing since the flood uh, back in the early 2000s. We need to make sure that we're up to meet the demand. Uh, and this, again, is an investment in the future, and, and we need to make sure that we insist on public transit options as often as possible to get as many cars off the road as possible. So while it's great to have uh, upgraded highways and, and roads, and we do need those, we do need to focus more on public transit options and making sure public transit is affordable or, where possible, free of charge. made the single largest investment in infrastructure in Canada's history because we heard from every single municipal leader that there was a deficit. And in the process of investing in infrastructure, whether it's social infrastructure, public transit, or green infrastructure, we are creating tens of thousands of jobs in this country. Via Rail, as you know, is chugging along. We have moved forward uh, more in the last four years on this initiative than we ever have. And I have to thank those who've come before us, including those who worked on the Shining Waters initiative. We have a plan and investments have been set aside to ensure that we have cell access as well as broadband. Municipalities told us that they were tired of the provinces and the federal government's uh, politics uh, getting in the way of them getting their investments. So we've doubled the gas tax transfer and they're getting it directly to meet their needs. The Trent Severn Waterway is a really good example of a local piece of infrastructure. Some 386 kilometers of it has received $600 million in investments and it's creating jobs and making our community even nicer. Infrastructure investment is always the right kind of investment. Now, when it comes to Shining Waters Railway Board, you know, I was on that board in 2013. Rail is something that is definitely near and dear to my heart. You know, I want to see the Via Rail project happen. You know, I want to see Via basically come from Ottawa or Montreal to Ottawa through to Peterborough. Um, for myself, I like the previous government's plan with Via and having them they actually raise investment money directly. You know, it's the same presentation that Via presented here in Peterborough a year ago. To me, that's a much better plan than using an infrastructure development bank because infrastructure development banks, which is the current process, um, specifically just another government tape on top of another government tape. So for us, I'd like to see Via Rail come through with a direct project that they're directly invested in as opposed to coming through a project where they're going through a third party investment development bank. Now, as far as internet access, you know, internet access should be a basic essential right. We need to make sure that our entire riding is enabled and it's something that I'm personally going to fight for to make sure that internet access is brought to everywhere inside this riding because we shouldn't have anywhere that doesn't have connectivity. Alexander. So one of the things I want to focus on to ensure that our infrastructure capabilities are increased is opening up our markets to competition. Uh, for the telecommunications industry specifically, as well as the air industry, by opening up the, uh, the markets to competition, we ensure that there are corporations with the capital assets available to be able to build that infrastructure. Uh, things like Verizon or, or Eurotel will able to be, come into this country and ensure that they 
are providing that access to our rural communities because they have the capital to build things like cell towers and network infrastructure. Uh, with regards to air travel, we want to pursue open skies agreements and, and privatize airports so that they're not just money-making schemes for the government, but that they work for the people. In addition, we want to make sure that there's investments in new forms of rail, but also that when we're trying to build a railway, such as via rail through Peterborough, we're not spending $71 million just to study it before we actually build it. We, we have been studying the high frequency rail project and the previous government's approach to growing our economy did not work. That's why the economy was in a recession in 2015. That's why this community's hopes continue to get up and built up about the possibility of a train, which never came. Our governments moved that vision forward more than the previous government did in 10 years. And I remain committed to ensuring that I fight in every way I can to make sure that that via rail, high frequency rail initiative is finalized and Peterborough is among the communities that benefits. Thank you. I'd like to offer that the reason for the recession in 2015 was very much out of the control of uh, all Canadian governments. You might recall that the oil prices across the world were temporarily fixed and they decided to stop fixing their prices, so please go ahead and produce as much oil as you'd like. The oil price tanked. I was laid off as a railroader. We stopped shipping oil. We stopped shipping goods back to Alberta. That's two, that was two trains that dropped right off the map. And what that meant was, you know, in a, in a terminal of 40 conductors, we were 22 laid off. Thank you. Just confirming with my colleague here. Uh, people are getting tired and the questions are getting a little more repetitive, so this is going to be our last question. Uh, it's been an, a great engaging debate. I'm actually going to put two questions together and I wonder if my timekeepers have it all programmed, but could we have a minute 30 seconds programmed in? Is that possible? Okay, because I'm going to give you two questions that are related, but I'll give you a minute 30 seconds, okay? Uh, so I want to turn uh, now to trade, and I want to talk both about export and our internal trade. So what's your party's position on trade and diversifying trading partners, as well as your plan to encourage more export by Canadian businesses? And then as well, interprovincial trade barriers are a challenge for many businesses. How will your government encourage more provincial cooperation to see the improved movement of goods across the country? So generally around trade inside and outside of Canada, and I think this round we're starting with Cassandra, right? Candace. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting tired too. <laughs> uh, so the NDP will not expose Canada or Canadian companies to an unfair trade system. Uh, we believe that any trade agreements must be mutually beneficial to both countries and deliver benefits to the citizens of those countries, to all of the citizens of those countries. Uh, we must include Indigenous communities in trade negotiations that affect them. Um, we, are, we, we, we believe that we need to be able to move goods and services uh, and we'll develop a fair and secure system of digital trade. Um, and we will also, we also believe that small businesses and medium-sized businesses deserve as much access to export markets as multinational corporations. So we would do our best to support you there. Uh, only the NDP recognizes the essential role that government plays in economy and in making uh, good trade agreements that support you are as a large part of that role. Um, we, the, the, the other parties often claim to uh, want to limit government, but then they pick and choose favorites, so they make deals with large corporations, and we want to put an end to that because it lacks fairness uh, and transparency and creates uncertainty and inefficiency. In regards to interprovincial trade, uh, we want to work to harmonize worker and consumer regulations. Um, and unfortunately, the, uh, my colleagues who've been in power federally uh, have had decades of combined failure on this topic. We'll work hard to ensure uh, that not only will we make it simpler for you, um, but we guide you through that process. Thank you. Marianne. 
for our businesses to be successful, it's preferable to have access to markets worth billions of people and not just do trade within some 37 to 40 million people here in Canada. So I'll, I'll start with international trade. We believe that uh, the diversity of trade is important, attracting job creating investments is important, and the benefits of trade have to be widely shared. We've signed three progressive free trade agreements in one mandate and when we as a country face unprecedented challenge from the US over the terms of NAFTA, our government recognized that the stakes were so great that we adopted a Team Canada approach. When Americans imposed steel and, tariff, uh, steel and aluminum tariffs, we fought until they were dropped and this community was at the forefront of that advocacy. And because of that, we ended up with a better deal. A deal that protected supply management, we protected dispute resolution, we rejected a sunset clause and we protected Canadian culture as well as secured better environmental and labour protections. In terms of interprovincial trade barriers, uh, we're already taking action to do that, uh, and these trade barriers make up uh, the trade makes up about 20% of Canada's GDP. We will create a Canada Free Trade Tribunal to hear, investigate, and help resolve cases where domestic barriers may exist. And I will say that we've we've eliminated the only remaining federal barrier to trade in alcoholic beverages within the country, which is a first step in ensuring that that free trade is maintained. Thank you. Now, Mike. So free trade is essential to all of our business. Now, we know today that small businesses only use free trade, but 4% are only exporting their products. We want to see that grow. You know, under their former Conservative government, we increased trade relationships with 53 different agreements. We will continue to focus on doing that. Getting our products out of Canada into market is very, very important for us. You know, we're also continuing to invest in um, Export Development Canada, which is an agency that supports our local companies as well as national companies to export their products. And one of the things we're going to do is focus, we're going to add additional resources to um, focus on clean technology that's being exported to make sure that the type of, type of technology that's created here can be exported to the global market. Now when it comes to interprovincial trade, this is something that has to be resolved. We've seen this for a long time where different provinces are putting up separate barriers amongst each other. You know, we want to see those barriers dropped and so we're going to put together a task force to work with all the provinces to drop interprovincial trade. We know for a fact that Canada can become less competitive when we can't share resources, whether that's people or whether that's products across our borders. And so we have to continue to make sure that that's focused on. And we can do that by working with the different premiers to make sure that they can work together as a collective framework. And the last thing is a lot of trade comes from regulations internally. And so one of the reasons why our different provinces have challenges working with other provinces is because there's lots of different regulations. So by streamlining the regulations across our country, it's going to allow us to create trade at a much better level. Thank you. Alex. So first and foremost, I'll, I'll start with the uh, interprovincial trade barriers, and we are in favor of abolishing them completely. Uh, it doesn't make sense for a Canadian citizen to be penalized for trying to trade within their own country. Uh, and then we see significant detrimental results of these interprovincial trade barriers uh, through things such as a you know, potential trade war developing between Alberta and British Columbia. That is not conducive to a uh, United Nation. It's, it's not conducive to ensure that we can move forward as a country. Uh, but in addition to that, we want to make sure that our, for, for free trade, we want to make sure that uh, we're abolishing the CRTC and opening up our market to telecommunications industries. We want to make sure that we're opening up the air industry to ensure that that free, that free trade can mean lower prices for Canadians. And, and in addition to that, we want to make sure that we're abolishing supply management. Uh, you know, you can sit up here all day and talk about free trade, but as long as you're continuing to enforce a 300% tariff on certain dairy products, that's not free trade. At the end of the day, that is not a free trade agreement. And we want to make sure that all industries are subject to the same level of freedom of choice and maintaining that throughout our, our, our country. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, I'd like to generally agree with my colleague, Ms. Montsev. Um, when we craft our policies, we try to make them about the differences that our parties represent. And so what we found is that over the last four years, uh, in, insofar as international trade goes, um, that we have found this to be an agreeable kind of work that has been done and we would like to see that kind of agreeable kind of work continue. Um, so where it comes to uh, where it comes to NAFTA, 
or the um, Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Um, those are good deals that we can get behind. And uh, I'd like to offer that, you know, the, the subtle variances where the Green Party policy comes into play are, for example, we'd like to we'd like to work with the World Trade Organization and turn it into the World Trade and Climate Organization. We'd like to see that kind of um, forward movement in our international trade as it relates to the climate crisis that we find ourselves in. It's going to be in every part of our lives and it's going to be in, uh, in the way that we do our international trade. Um, on the topic of uh, provincial barriers, I'd like to offer that as a licensed financial advisor, I can only work in Ontario and this is a barrier for me to work with my family who live in Vancouver. Uh, so this is, uh, I would like to reflect Ms. Shaw's comments about how the different regulatory bodies for same industries can definitely start to get together and work on nationalizing their regulations. Um, and this is uh, in our uh, platform as well. So anyways, uh, lastly I'd like to add that it is absolutely imperative. Oh, well, well. <laughs> All right, well, I was just writing down all of the topics we've covered tonight in the past two and a half hours. So we have covered housing, small business taxation, innovation environment, agri-food, debt, workforce, mortgage stress test, diversity of workforce, carbon tax, addictions, online digital taxation, trade infrastructure, and the overall view of business from government. So thank you very much. That is a lot of ground that we covered and a lot of information provided to our members. So we are now moving to our closing uh, remarks. Everybody will get a minute and we will start with Andrew. Thank you. Uh, before I start, shall we agree that we're going to stand or sit for our closing remarks? <laughs> anyway, you lead. What, whatever you would like I'm to I'm going do. to stay seated then. And I'm <laughs> trusting all of you to follow. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you all for committing to staying this entire time, um, I, and I appreciate uh, um, ca capping the questions there. I, I'm definitely feeling the hour. Um, I'd like to offer that as a business owner and um, as a, um, uh, an aspiring future member of Parliament, I'd like to offer that I think the most important investment for business owners is to start planning for how this climate crisis is going to directly affect your business. And this can be seen locally here in the Peterborough Quartha. Is that 30 seconds? Um, wow. We are already facing crop failures. We are already uh, consider, considering the prospect that we may have difficulty sourcing what we need for our businesses. And I would like to suggest to you that it's absolutely necessary for you to plan your business um, with your eye on this climate crisis that we face. Uh, in, in the best way for all of us to come together with our federal government and on October 21st, vote for strong climate policy, get everybody on board, vote green. Thank you. Alexander. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight and, and sticking around this long for those of you that are still in the audience. And, and thank you again to the organizers of this debate uh, for enabling us to speak. Uh, you've heard my proposals, you've, you've heard my arguments, you've, you've heard what we've all had to say, which means for at least the time being, we've done our part. Uh, and now it's up to you uh, in order to make the decision on how you're going to vote in October. Uh, I will fight to ensure that we are protecting your individual rights as Canadians. I will fight to ensure that your business potential is unleashed. I'll fight to ensure that you have more money in your pockets so that you can better afford the, the essentials in life. But it's not just things like that. It's, it's, it's bringing accountability back to government. It's ensuring that the Canadian government is acting as a steward of your taxpayer money. It's ensuring that we are spending money responsible, uh, responsibly and with integrity. And that leads back to everything that I've said tonight. So if you want to make sure that there is a more accountable government after uh, October 21st, vote for the People's Party of Canada. Vote for Alexander Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank everyone that's still in the audience as well, and a quick shout out to CPAC, who uh, was with me this morning at 8.30 this morning, so they've been up uh, quite a long time as well. Um, you know, from what we've heard tonight, I think it's clear that Canada is at a crossroads, you know, and our economic future is being defined. I believe that most of us here do not want to encumber future generations with massive debt. We do not want to choose between billions of dollars in interest payments or funding important environmental initiatives or critical social programs like health and education. 
I believe Peter Report's business community, you, have a great potential here, whether it's a small restaurant on Hunter Street, or a marina in Buckhorn, or the next clean tech company. But our capacity to grow and succeed really depends on a government that stays out of our pockets and does not impose obstacles that erode our ability to compete. So I believe that I have the skills to drive through as the next Member of Parliament, and I hope that my background and what you've heard tonight is something that will consider you to vote for myself, Michael Skinner, on October 21st. Thank you. I'm grateful to everybody who's brought us together and to everybody who's worked hard to keep us all here together and to my fellow candidates. A lot has changed since 2015. There's 200 more million dollars in our community in federal investments. Unemployment is way down. Over 1,400 families have a place to call home and we still have a lot of work left to do. We have a plan. That plan is working because Canadians are working. And on October 21st, I'm asking for your support once again so that we can continue to move Canada forward, so we can lift people out of poverty, build and create wealth while fighting climate change. I will also say this. This community, Thinking Small, has never served us well. When we've come together as a community, when we have dreamed big, we have made great things happen. We renovated this place. We, re we built Trent University. We built Fleming College. Let's dream build big and build the kind of Peterborough that in 50 years from now, our children and grandchildren will be proud of. So I'll echo my colleagues' sentiments and say thank you to all of you, to the organizers and to the beautiful Market Hall, which I feel is in many ways uh, one of my favorite homes in downtown Peterborough. Uh, I believe that we need clear leadership. We need a clear plan based in science to combat the climate crisis. We need a clear plan to make living in Canada and being healthy in Canada more affordable. Uh, we need a just transition to a green economy that creates jobs, uh, not just takes them away. Uh, we need to make sure that we are covering Canadians uh, with pharmacare and head-to-toe healthcare, and that we are retraining them or training them for the new jobs in this new green economy. Uh, we want to create the best educated, healthiest, best trained workforce in the world, and we are very close to it. Uh, my government commits to our projects, we keep our promises, uh, and we will move forward with you. I believe in each of you, and I believe in this community. On October 21st, please vote Candace Shaw. Thank you very much, candidates. It has been a very informative evening. I'd like to thank our fellow business organizations. It's been a pleasure collaborating with all of you to bring everyone together. Thank you to Rhonda for joining me in moderating duties. Well done, and a special thank you to our audience. You've heard it here. Election day is Monday, October 21st, 2019. Do not forget to vote. Thank you, and enjoy your rest of the evening.